Hyrax? And I was like, I have no idea. Let me look it up. <laughs> and so then we found these super cute little creatures. They're in the Bible. Talks about the Hyrax in there. And uh, I was going to put up some uh, crazy Australian animals, because if you know any animals at all in Australia, they're all insane. Um, but then I thought some of you might be flat earthers and uh, you don't believe Australia exists. So I threw up one from the Bible instead. So <laughs> that definitely exists. Um, anyway, so these are all things that God has made. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples he built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. And so that's, uh, just, a, just as a reminder, that's who we're responding to when we sing these songs. So it's like I woke up this morning and I was going to tell you guys, oh, we're going to sing songs to God. And then I was like, to God, to God. Are you kidding me? So that's what we're going to do. So <laughs> I encourage you to join with us. Reign in endless power above the world you made, and across the sky is written your majesty and praise. And still you move in mercy, hear the humble heart, every soul that's searching. Jesus, there you are. Your beauty fills the skies. Your glory. Great God of countless wonders, I will lift my eyes. Your beauty fills the skies, your glory reigns in brilliant light. Great God of countless wonders, I will lift my eyes. The mysteries of heaven, all your works displayed, every star, every Universe proclaims every sun that rises in faithfulness to me, like the changing of the seasons, like the river to the sea. Yeah. Your beauty fills the skies, your glory reigns in brilliant light, great God of countless wonders.
Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul, I live for you alone, every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord, have your way in me. This is my desire, this is my Lord, with all my heart, worship you. And all I have within me, I give you praise. All that I adore is in you. I give you my heart, I give you my soul. For you alone, every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord, have your way in me. Give you my heart, I give you my soul. Live for you alone, every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord, have your way. Nonsense, bless his 
backed up by my light. So I hope the melody's pleasant. I hope it pleases you. But I know that the life behind it is what plays the real tune. So where my declarations still fall short of the truth. All that Self-righteousness I wouldn't be the first disciple To betray you with a kiss Empty hallelujahs Always fail to impress Whatever the claims I try to make You see through my defense Jesus, what you're after Is love from a pure heart A conscience clean and a sincere faith Are the kind of life you want distant shores rejoice. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and consumes his foes on every side. His lightning lights up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness and all the people see his glory. All who worship images are put to shame. Those who boast in idols worship him, all you gods. Zion hears and rejoices and the villages of Judah are glad because of your judgments, Lord. For you, Lord, are the most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. Let those who love the Lord hate evil, for he guards the lives of his faithful ones and delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Light shines on the righteous and joy on the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you who are righteous, and praise his holy name. Psalm 97, when Seth had the pictures up there, just reminded me of Psalm 97. Uh, when it talks about the, melting, the earth uh, melting like wax and, and lightning lights up the world and fire consumes everything. It's like those images should get us to a place where we realize that there is a God that is so much bigger than anything that's going on in our life. There's a God that is so much bigger than uh, anything that we can imagine that he can make that stuff. And it's like it's crazy to me because some people then turn to those things and worship those things. And it's like do not get that there's this God that made everything, and, and that's who we should worship. So as we're here this morning, as, as you came, uh, for whatever reason you've come, whatever reason you're here, uh, I, I'm happy that you're here. But as we sing this next song, let's fix our eyes on the God who created all of that super cool stuff. Let's fix our eyes on the God who created all the stars in the heaven and all the planets and all the galaxies and, and the, you know, the universe, the known universe, because you know that there's more than what we know because God's way bigger than what we can ever know. So let's worship that God as we continue to worship. Ready my heart for all you would speak. I'm here to listen, here to receive. Ready my heart for all you would say. Lord, find me open, ready to change. At the word of the Lord, all things came to be. The planets were formed, the land and the sea. The power of your word endures still today. So 
Lord, find me open to all you would say, every word. One word from you is wiser than any human insight, method, or plan. Find me open to your word. Find me open to your love. Find me open to your voice. And find me open to change whatever it is in me that is not of you. Whatever it is in me that does not resemble you. Whatever it is in me that needs to change, God, I want that to change. And I know myself, Lord, and I know that sometimes I am stubborn and sometimes I go kicking and screaming, but God, I want to be not like that. So help me, Lord, and help each of us today in this place. Whatever, whatever's going on in our hearts and minds, I pray you would help us to change. You would help us to be open to what it is that you want to speak to us. You would help us to be open to hear 
your word to us today. That we would not just listen to the word and so deceive ourselves. We would actually do what it says. God, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the fact that you continually call us to yourself and draw us to yourself and desire for us to draw closer to you. Help us to be those who do that today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning. A couple of announcements. Grab a May calendar if you don't have one of those. Check it out on there because... Um, on Saturday, coming up, is men's breakfast, okay? So men's breakfast is a time uh, where some men are going to get together and have breakfast here at the church. Uh, it's not BYOB, okay? So you don't have to bring your own breakfast. It'll be supplied for... What'd you get? What were you guys thinking I was talking about? Jeez. Anyways, uh, bring your own breakfast. If you're a dude and you like to eat, you should come to men's breakfast, okay? That's really what it's about. 8 a.m., right here at the church, breakfast provided, and there'll be coffee, and we'll talk a little bit. Um, and it might not be me, so that's also a draw. Somebody else could talk, okay? Um, also, uh, other stuff on the calendar, check that out. Tithe and offering baskets back there. Also, if you're a new visitor, please fill out a new visitor card. Okay, before we get started, um, I, you know, Seth often steals my thunder. I'm just saying right off the bat. Like, he just often does things that I had planned on doing. So, like, I normally just have my regular old PowerPoint, and here's all the points. But I actually had some slides today, too. But, of course, Seth is far ahead of me, so he stole my thunder. But that's okay. So, uh, if you don't know, a bunch of us went to, well, several of us went to a conference this last, we left on Wednesday. We got back yesterday uh, afternoon, a leadership conference at this place down in California, a church down there, a big church. Like, this church is like big, like the building that we were in is the main campus, probably seats, I don't know, somewhere between th three and 4,000 people. So we're talking, like basically our entire church was kind of like the size of their stage. You know what I'm saying? I mean, this is a big place. And we went down there to this leadership conference and it was cool, you know, and, and there's a lot of stuff that's going on in my head and then a processing to bring it to you guys, a lot of great teaching, things I'll be probably, you know, sharing for a while. But I wanted to share with you one thing. So this is a giant building, giant building, like huge building. And uh, on the back of the building, they have uh, these, these uh, banners, okay? So can we get the first slide up there? Okay, so this is the back of the building, giant building. And they have these three banners. I know you can't read them, so I'm going to tell you what they say. Uh, the first one says, reach wide, which means there's a ton of people in this world that need Jesus. And it's our job to reach wide, not just this little you know, niche that we think we have here, but pretty, pretty much everyone. Uh, the next one says teach deep. And teaching deep, uh, that was the one that kind of, you know, was like, for me, I was like, okay, that's, that's, hopefully that's where we're going, that there's, uh, we're coming up on some deep teaching, and we've had some, so I was like, that's a good one. And then the third one says unleash compassion. And basically, like, everybody needs compassion. Everybody needs it. And so, but the teach deep one, that was like I said, I like, uh, you know, it really spoke to me the most. So can I get the next slide real quick? Like, the, it was just deep, like teach deep. And I was like, why is this so important to me? One more. <laughs> if you can't see that, that is our very own youth pastor, Michael Waldrop, on a billboard in some church in California. Uh, so if we're worried about licensing stuff, maybe they can talk to us about that. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it was crazy. Uh, Michael and I had went to this conference in 2019. That was the last time it had been uh, uh, where you could go. You know, the last two years it was not going on. And uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's deep right there. That's deep. He's deep. All right, go to the next slide. <laughs> Sorry, Michael. <laughs> we had this game, too, we decided to play. We are like, because, you know, uh, Michael and I and Seth, we all lived in California for a while, and so we're like, okay, if you see somebody you know, you get 100 points. If you talk to that person, you get 200 points. If you can get a selfie with them, 300 points. Once we saw the banner, we just stopped playing. It's like, how can we even beat that? Like, Michael's on a banner, for crying out loud. And like, it wasn't just the banner for this conference. This is on their building. Like, it's probably been on there since 2019. Who knows? Well, he's like the poster child for deep. <laughs> Which is awesome. But I feel like it's a message directly to us, you know. Uh, but also one of those things, whenever you go somewhere, you're going to receive something. Sometimes you also leave something. So there's that. All right. 
We started a new series uh, a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, whatever. Book of Malachi, you can turn there if you want. Uh, it's the last book in the Old Testament. It's, got, it's, it's tough, all right? And I'm going to tell you right now, we've been through two weeks of it. It's, it's hard teaching. It's pointed. It might make you mad, um, and it might rub you the wrong way, and there might be stuff in there that you're like, ah, you know what? When those things happen to me personally, that's when I know I need to hear something. If I'm, if I'm feeling like, ah, I know that's like God speaking to me to try to get something going in my brain and my heart. So, because it points us back to the things that God says are important. So, quick rundown. The people of God have become apathetic. They were uh, lacking uh, passion and emotion and excitement for the things of God. They, they lacked interest for God. But they were still coming, right? Still going through the motions. They were still going to church services. They were still serving to some degree. They were giving to some degree. But they just weren't that into it. They, it, was just, it was just something they did rather than something that lived in them and was part of them. And the same thing often happens for us as well. And this is where you have to decide where you are when you stand, you know, when we stand here. It's like, not just the thoughts in your head, but your, your actions. Like, am I being apathetic toward God? Toward the things of God? Toward the church? Am I just like, eh, kind of like going through the motions or not? And, and really, the, the whole open and shut thing came from this verse in chapter 1, verse 10. It says, oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I am not pleased with you says the Lord Almighty, and I will accept no offering from your hands. Oh, that you would shut the doors. Basically, God was saying, I would rather literally have no worship than the garbage worship that you're currently giving me. I would rather you not worship at all than just come into my house and, you know, whatever you can muster up based on how you feel. I would rather you don't give me anything than give me the lame stuff that you're giving me. I would rather you say nothing than telling me empty promises that you're never going to keep. I would rather the doors be shut than for you to just keep going through the motions. And again, we've got to point this back to ourselves. This is an individual assessment. This isn't, we're not here to examine the church in America. We're not here to examine the church in Coos County. Or we're not here to examine Life Change Church. We're here to examine ourselves. And so my question for you is that the way you come to God and the way you personally are, are coming to church and are doing the things that God calls you to do, are you just going through the motions? Because if you are, I think he's like saying, shut the door. There's no point in that. Or are you living a life that it doesn't want to be apathetic, that wants to throw the doors wide open and see what God's going to do? And my hope is that it's the second. Uh, but as if it's the first, then please hear what's going on here. Because as we're going through this series and examining the way the Israelites are operating, we need to look at ourselves, open or shut. And you get to decide. Okay, so we started in Malachi chapter 1. We talked about how doubt leads to apathy, specifically doubting God's love for us. Last week, we talked about how denying his glory uh, leads to apathy. And, and today, we're moving on. We're in Malachi chapter 2. And hey, here's the deal. Just side note. If you guys came in here today, by the way, it's Happy Mother's Day. If you guys came in here today and were like, oh, you know, he's going to talk about, you know, Proverbs 31 woman and all that stuff. That's not the way we do things around here, all right? Happy Mother's Day going to be hard, okay? But isn't being a mother hard, really? So there you go, okay. I don't know, because I'm not a mother. Anyways, let me read something real quick before I get into the passage in Malachi, because it's important that I lay this out for you real quick. First Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 9 says this, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Did you hear that? You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. Okay? Everybody got it? Okay, Malachi chapter 2. And now, you priests, see, because I didn't want you to think it was just written to the leadership. This is for you, all right? Now, you priests, this warning is for you. If you do not listen, if you do not resolve to honor my name, says the Lord Almighty, I will send a curse on you, and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have already cursed them because you have not resolved to honor me. Because of you, I will rebuke your descendants. I will smear on your faces the dung from your festival sacrifices, and you will be carried off with it. Happy Mother's Day. And you will know that I have sent you this warning, so that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord Almighty. My covenant was with him, a covenant of life and peace, and I gave them, I, I gave them to him. This called for reverence, and he revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and nothing false was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness and turned many from sin. 
For the lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge, because he is the messenger of the Lord Almighty, and people seek instruction from his mouth. But you have turned from the way, and by your teaching have caused many to stumble. You have violated the covenant with Levi, says the Lord Almighty, so I have caused you to be despised and humiliated before all the people, because you have not followed my ways, but have shown partiality in the matters of the law. Okay. So this isn't for just the people in charge, it's for each one of us, all right? And what you need to know today is that you're going to decide. One way or the other, you're going to decide if you're going to be apathetic or not apathetic. You get to decide. And I know the past couple of weeks may have seemed hard, but really, I don't feel like we have time to like baby step through this. I think that this is an important season that we're in. I think that there is people literally out there that are, that are going to hell because they don't know Jesus. And we are sitting in here, and I don't want us just sitting in here warming up a seat going through the motions anymore. It's, it's pointless. If we're not going to receive what it is God has for us and then take it out to this world, what are we doing? I mean, really, just trying to make ourselves feel better? There's no, there's no point in that, okay? Now, if this is your first time, welcome to Life Change Church. I hope you come back. All right, um... Let's look at the decision that we're going to make. Today, what I want you to do, what I want to do is list out some things, and you're going to decide one way or the other. And uh, I'm going to look at some things, what to do today. Like, what, what's going to happen, right? Doing things, though. Doing things. But if we listen to what we, what we go through today, and you decide not to do them, you decide not to walk in them, you decide not to, you know, whatever, you have to understand you are willfully disobeying the Lord. Okay? And that is the same thing we talked about last week, which is talked about contempt for him. And we don't want to do that, right? That's bad. We learned that last week. It's bad. Let's not do that. Okay, so here's what we're called to do. Here's the decision and what we're called to do. Number one, you can write down the word prize. I talk about this a lot because it's super important. We are called to prize God above everything else. Right from the beginning of this chapter, it's the most important part because if we don't have him as number one in our lives then everything we do is not coming from the place it should be. If he is not literally in our minds and in our actions and in our hearts the best thing that there is, we are missing it. We are missing it right there. All the other points we're going to talk about today will mean nothing to you if we are not people who prize him, who revere him, who stand in awe of him. If it's just like, oh, he's, gonna, he's all right, every other point is just going to be pointless at this point. Not too many points. All right. Sorry. Here's why we don't revere him. I'm going to tell you for the most part why most people don't revere him, don't stand in awe of him, because we're too busy revering ourselves. We have the uncanny ability to think and act and speak like we're the most important. And that's what these priests were doing. God wasn't the prize to them. You could see that God wasn't the prize by what they were bringing to him. He was just an inconvenience that they had to deal with rather than the absolute number one priority in their lives. And how did God feel about these people not revering, not honoring, not standing in awe of his name? Verse 3. Because of you, I will rebuke your descendants. I will smear on your faces the dung from your festival sacrifices, and you will be carried off with it. You know, I think it's important to take a deeper look at this because that's, that's just the way I operate, right? Uh, because I often come up with examples that are kind of gross. You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah, okay. I have, uh, there's a couple here that's been coming to church here many years. The first time they ever came to church, I talked about head lice. <laughs> they kept coming. They still come. They're, they're, they're awesome. They keep coming all the time, right? But I talk about things like lice and vomit and bad smells and rotten things. And I talk about those things all the time to drive home points so that you will remember. Because if you leave a church service and somebody talked about some rotten, stinking thing, you're going to be like, I remember that. Like today, I guarantee you, you're going to remember poop. I know, and you're like, are we supposed to? It'll make sense in a little bit, okay? And I do that so you would have this image in your head to remember what it was God was trying to tell you that day. So the first thing we can learn from this passage is I didn't make this up. Like, you guys sometimes think, like, I just talk about gross stuff because I'm immature, and I don't know whether that's pretty much it. <laughs> but I didn't make this practice up. I didn't invent it. God did that. God talked about gross stuff long before I ever did. 
And this is God speaking to the prophet. Now, could he have been exaggerating maybe, but I really doubt it. I think Malachi was saying to these guys exactly what God was telling him to say. The next thing we can learn from this passage is that God wasn't using this as some kind of hyperbole or you know, extreme example to get his point across. I think God was like this. I think God was like, I'm so tired of your crap and the crap way that you're coming to me and the crap way that you're giving me sacrifices and the, that are crappy and the crap way that you're revering my name that I'm actually going to use crap to get my point across. Not only that, I'm going to rebuke your descendants as well. So there's that too. So if you're like, well, I don't care what you do to me, well, why don't you think about somebody else besides yourself for once? Because he's also going to rebuke your kids. All right. The Levites were the priests, and God is like the covenant. The agreement was this. I give you life and peace. You revere my name. You stand in awe of me. I give you life and peace. You realize I'm the prize. You get life and peace. When we revere his name and stand in awe of him and realize he really is the prize, when we decide those things, it changes everything. It changes everything. We come to the place where we realize we're no longer in charge. God's in charge. We don't do things based on what we think. We do things based on what God wants us to do. We don't do things based on what other people think or what we think other people are thinking. We do things based on what God tells us to do. We don't get bogged down by this life and this world we live in. We run toward the prize all the time, and the prize is God. And listen, you decide based not on your words, but on your actions. And you're going to decide today. Today, you're going to decide what the prize is, what you're going to run toward, what you're going to, what you're going to think on, what you're going to seek after. And tomorrow, you're going to decide again. And tomorrow, and the next day, you're going to decide again. And every day from here on out. And my hope is that we decide he is the prize and that we live accordingly. All right, number two, preparation. It says, true instruction was in his mouth and nothing false was found on his lips. Talking about instruction here. Preparation, talking about instruction here, okay? Specifically, uh, instruction as how to prepare people. What are we preparing them for? Here's what your instruction should prepare people to do. To know Jesus. That's it. If your instruction is not preparing people to know Jesus, to draw close to Jesus, to love Jesus, you see what, who all this is all about? It's all about Jesus, right? If what we're saying is not doing those things, what is the point? I think of the Pharisees, right? Pharisees were religious leaders. They were like, okay, so you know some pastors that are like super smart and know a bunch of stuff, and, but, you know, they're, I don't know. I don't know if you know anybody like that. Anyways, but they, they had all this knowledge, but there was, there was nothing going on in their lives. There was no love. There was no nothing. They, were, they, they instruct people. That was their job. They instruct people. They prepared people. But their instruction and preparation was all about uh, was all about the rules that they had made up, okay? It was about the rules that God had given, but then they had added a bunch of rules on top of that, right? And then that way they were very, uh, it was very easy for them to be able to tell people when they were doing something wrong, when they were doing something right. And, and here's why and all of this stuff, and here's the things. And See, here's the deal. Instruction is pointless unless you're instructing people with the right thing and to go the right way, unless it's true instruction. And I have found more and more, as I have walked with Jesus, I have less answers for you guys, okay? <laughs> that's, that's what I'm learning. It's like, as I draw closer to Jesus, you know what I have less of? Any idea what I'm doing. I don't know why God does the things that he do, did in the Bible. I don't know why. Now, you know, I, I, I used an example during first service about the Amalekites, and God told Saul to, King Saul back then, to wipe out the Amalekites. And I know there were some reasons because, you know, at one point, you know, the Amalekites did some stuff to God's people. I totally get that, right? But here's the thing. When God said to wipe out the Amalekites, he said wipe out the Amalekites, wipe out the men, wipe out the women, kill all the babies, kill all their animals, kill everything that has anything to do with the Amalekites. I don't understand that. Guess what? It's not my job to understand that. I don't know why some things happen one way and some things happen another. I don't know why... Bad things happen to people who are trying to follow Jesus wholeheartedly, and good things happen to people who don't even believe in him. I don't know why those things happen. I am, I am, I am basic, okay? I'll, I know the basics. Here, here's the basics. Jesus loves every single person in this world. Every single 
person in this world is loved by Jesus. So much love that he died for each and every one of them. That includes me, and that includes you, and that includes the person you don't really like, and that includes the person who disagrees with you, and that includes the person who says they hate God and they hate Christians. Guess what? Jesus loves that person. Died for that person. He loves every single person, whoever has lived and whoever will live. And I want us to be people who have true instruction on our lips, and we're preparing people not for... Uh, you know, here's a bunch of information about preparing people to fall in love with Jesus. Here's, here's true instruction. Jesus loves you. He died for you. And in him you can have life. That's it. That's true instruction. And that's really the majority of what matters, you guys. Seriously. As we talk about preparation, it's not about knowing a bunch of stuff. It's about knowing Jesus. I have met people who know a bunch of stuff about Jesus. The problem is they don't know Jesus. I know a bunch of stuff about, let's see, when I was younger, I, I followed like football a lot more than I do now uh, when I was younger. I was, I'm, I'm a Raiders fan. I know. I'm a Raiders fan. Anyways, when I was younger, I knew a lot about Marcus Allen. He was running back way back in the 80s. But I knew a lot about him because he was my favorite running back, and he was legit, like seriously legit. And I was like, I, I knew a lot about him. But guess what? I didn't know him. It wasn't like we had dinner together. It wasn't like I ever talked to him. I could tell you all kinds of stuff, you know? I could tell you, like, all kinds of stats and weird stuff like that. You guys know what I'm talking about? You guys all have it. It's probably not a football player. It's probably some, I don't know. I don't know, something. But you know a bunch of stuff about the person, but you don't know them. That, that's how it is with Jesus. When it comes to true instruction, it's not about knowing a bunch of stuff about him. It's about knowing him. Now, am I saying, oh, well, oh, Pastor Dale said we don't need to know a bunch of stuff, so I don't need to read the Bible or study it or memorize it or any, you know, do any Bible studies or anything like that. That's not what I'm saying. I say do all of those things, but let it come from a place of what's important, which is true instruction. Let's be those ready to prepare people with true instruction, which is Jesus loves you and he died for you, and in him you can have life. All right, number three, peace. Peace. Walk with peace and uprightness. That's what the Bible says. It says, uh, true instruction was found in, his myth, found in his mouth and nothing false was on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness. I want you to think about the world we live in. I want you to think about the last couple of years. And I'm going to put some words out there that you might relate to over the last couple of years. Okay? Division. Hatred. Animosity. Fighting. Stress. Fear, anxiety, depression, war. We have lived in a world that has and continues to be torn apart by pretty much everything that you can think of that is opposite of peace. And if it was just out there in the world, I'd be like, no problem. That's the way the world's supposed to operate. That's the way they've always operated because they don't know Jesus and they don't have peace. But these same things are happening in here. Maybe not directly in this building, but in the church as a whole. But probably in this building to some degree, too. My guess is that each of you have a story or multiple stories. Something that has happened or maybe is in the process of happening that caused you to feel one of those things over the last couple of years. Or more of those things. Or one of those things in increasing measure over the last couple of years. I don't need to list some, some of the stuff that we've all dealt with. But listen, I don't know where I heard this, but I heard a guy probably in the last because like, I, I literally spent like probably like 22 hours of information coming into my head. So it's going to come out, I promise, but it's just bouncing around in there right now. Anyways, they said this. We don't need to focus on the problems. We need to focus on the promise. We don't need to focus on the problems. Everybody's got problems. We all got problems. But we're, what we need to focus on is what we're promised as followers of Christ. As we come to him, as we lay these things down before him, as we tru choose to trust him, you know what we're promised? Peace. That's what we're promised. As we come to him and just bring him, right? We're promised his peace. And listen, I had, there are times in the last couple of years where I had to remind myself of this. There are times in the last couple of years where other people had to remind me of this. Because I need help too, right? Because sometimes what is happening right here is so overwhelming that you can see nothing else. 
It's just right here. And it's everything, and it's consuming, and it consumes every thought or most every thought of your entire day. That's never going to bring you peace. We're promised peace when we come to him, right? When we lay our anxiety down before him through prayer and thanksgiving, we lay our requests before him, guess what he gives us? Peace, right? Isn't that what uh, Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 4? Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, with prayer and petition, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God will guard you. That's what we're promised. Then it talks about uprightness. And we think uprightness is like, oh, I'm not going to do all the bad things. I'm going to do all the good things. Look at me walking in uprightness. You know where uprightness comes? It comes from a life of peace. Because you ain't walking in uprightness if you ain't got peace. I mean, you can fake it for a while, but sooner it's going to stress you out. It's too much work. It's just too much. Uprightness comes from a life of peace. Listen, I, the, church, the church has put a lot, of, a lot of stress on people to try to live the right way. Right? Like, don't do this, do that, say this, don't say that, dress like this, don't dress like that. Here's all the rules you have to follow. Ah, it's too much. It's too much. Right? It's exhausting to be a Christian sometimes. Except it isn't. Because it's not about all that stuff. Come to Jesus, lay everything before him, receive peace. What is it? Wash, rinse, repeat. Over and over and over again, right? Don't, don't ever stop that. Bring it all. Bring it all. He can handle it. Lay it at his feet. And when you lay it at his feet, when you're done laying it at his feet, don't try to gather it back up and put it back in your knapsack. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if anybody knows what a knapsack is. But you know, it's backpack, duffel bag. Uh, garbage bag, whatever you carry your stuff in. Don't do it. Lay it before him. Receive his peace. All right? That, you get to decide. All right, number four, persuade. It says right after that, he turned many from sin, right? True instruction was in his mouth and nothing was false was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness and turned many from sin. He walked in me, walked with me with peace and uprightness and turned many from sin. Now, back to the world we live in. It's severely jacked up. This world's jacked up. There's a bunch of people out there who are not following God. Guess what? I want them to follow God. You know why? Because I get a bonus in heaven for as many people follow God? No, that's not how it works. No. I want them to follow God. So my natural inclination is like, hey, let's go follow God. And all of you, go out and tell people to follow God, right? But talking at people doesn't work. Before we can... Be those who turn many from sin, who turn people to see just how good God is and desire to follow him, it goes back to the peace. It all comes from the peace. Peace and uprightness, and they turned many from sin. See, we can't persuade anybody to turn from sin without peace and walking in an uprightness that comes from that. Then we have a platform to, turn, to help, right? And we walk it out. That's the uprightness, right? When we have the peace, walking it out, that's the uprightness. The result is many will turn from sin. Many will turn from sin. You know who the number one person on the list of many to be turning from sin is? You. That's, the, that's number one on many, okay? If you're like, I've got to turn many people from sin, we'll just start with number one. It's you. After that, it was well, for those who don't know Jesus, right? Or it's for those who know Jesus, but they're walking in sin. Or it's for this person or that person. Who sinned? Everybody. Everybody. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everyone needs to turn from sin. So the many, that includes every single person that you come into contact with, you have an opportunity to help them turn from sin. First and foremost, by walking it out in your own life. Listen, all of this goes back to peace. It really does. And I know maybe peace should have just been one long point, but I, you know, persuade kind of fit in there, so I had to throw it in. Anyways, it all goes back to peace. Listen, if you are a stress bucket, if you are an angry, unhappy person, if you are just generally a grumpy person, you need some peace in your life, okay? I had this picture. I really didn't want to talk about it second service because I talked about it first service, and I was like, should I talk about it? But I'm going to. Basically, I think the analogy here and everything going through about how God's talking about rubbing poop on your face, I think some people 
It's already there. It's already there. You can look at people, and it's like when you've got a grumpy, unhappy face, it's like it's already on your face. Who wants that? Anybody want poop on their face? Okay, great. I, uh, back in the day, a long time ago, I worked for Walmart. This was before Walmart was a super center. If you remember the old days, it was just a regular center, not a super center. And then on this side, there was a hillside, and it was grass, and it was like the whole parking lot level. And it was part of my job, I worked at Walmart, it was part of my job to weed eat that. And I had to weed eat it, and especially this time of year when it was raining, I had to weed eat it because it grows like crazy. You guys know what I'm talking about. So I'd get out there with the weed eater, and I'd be weed eating, right? And I'd have goggles on to protect my eyes because you protect your eyes, right? And you're weed eating. But guess what? There was this thing like people did. Like they would come to Walmart, and they would park right there. And then they would get their little dogs out, right? Or their big dogs out. And then they would let them go on the hill. And back in that day, there was no little poop bags. You know what I'm talking about? They didn't have those. We're like in the 90s. They might have had them. We didn't. Coos Bay didn't have them. You know what I'm saying? Nobody cleaned up anything after themselves, especially not after their dogs. And so I'd be weed eating. You know what I'm talking about? And that's when I learned how to weed eat with my mouth closed. All right. It's disgusting, right? Somebody just got it, and that's what I like. <laughs> if you don't have peace, that, that's what you look like. It's just on there. It's just on there. First service didn't get that one either, by the way, so I hope they're watching. All right. If, if you don't have peace, you're not walking in uprightness, and that's why people around you aren't just like, how do I have your life? How, how, why are, why, what is different in you? Why do you have peace in the midst of horrible circumstances. Why would they want that if we're not turning from sin? It's, it's crazy to me. It's crazy to me that we live in this world and we see people who don't know Jesus doing things that people who don't know Jesus are supposed to do and we get like appalled by it. Like, I can't believe the world's doing that. It's the world. It's literally their job. That's what they do. I was not a Christian for like 23 years of my life. I did those things because that's what I was trained to do. I was trained to lie and be a jerk and use people and manipulate. That, that's literally what I was trained to do. I was trained to be horrible to people. So why, why do we get like appalled by, oh my gosh, I can't believe the world these days. Really? That, that's the world. That's the way it is, right? I think we should be far more appalled when we're doing those things as people who say we're followers of Jesus and we're walking around with no peace. That should be appalling to us. But if, but if people see in a, a peace in us that's like mind-blowing, right? Like mind-blowing to the point like where they see you walking it out in the midst of circumstances that are super challenging, circumstances like people aren't being nice to you and they hurt your feelings. I mean, big circumstances, Right? Or the pastor offended you because earlier he said crap like 10 times in one sentence. Like, I can't believe you say crap so many times. Crap, crap, crap. All right, come on, let's go. <laughs> Get over it. I just said crap to give you contextual relevance because dung doesn't just carry the same weight these days. All right? When, you, when they see you walking through the hard stuff without literally losing your mind, I'm talking about the big hard stuff now. They're going to be attracted to you. You're going to turn many from sin just by living a life that's not crazy, that's not freaking out, that's not losing your mind over stuff that in the long run doesn't really matter anyways. It's not some religious duty. This is relationship with God. And when we walk in relationship with God, you know what it is? It's attractive to people. It's beautiful. It's the good news. That's the good news right there. That's what we should be persuading people to do. All right, preserve. Preserve knowledge. Okay, hope we can all understand that this part uh, about knowledge is the last on the list here for a reason because knowledge is not enough. In fact, it is the opposite of nothing. In fact, the Bible says knowledge puffs up, but love builds up, right? So knowledge is good. We should gain knowledge, but it has to be at the end of the day. It has to be after the relationship with Jesus. It has to be after the love of him and the peace of him is like, I can have a ton of knowledge on the subject. I can tell you a bunch of knowledge on the subject. But listen, 
If you're not interested in the subject, then who cares? If there's not something there that's drawing you to the subject, you're not going to listen to me, right? I'll tell you once I talked to a guy once. He said he was a Christian. I said it was a pastor. I started talking about Jesus. He started talking about stuff I didn't know what he was talking about. I literally did not have an idea what he was talking about. Not like Bible verses I'd never heard before, a revelation of something that was mind-blowing. He was saying big words. You guys know what I'm talking about, big words? Big, big church words. And you might not have ever heard one if you've been in life change church very long. So... I'm going to try to pronounce these. Uh, he was talking about hermeneutics, and he was talking about pneumatology. And listen, I just learned a couple of these this weekend. He was talking about uh, exegesis, which right there I stopped. And I was like, I don't want Jesus to exit anywhere. I want him to come into my life, right? It's different than that, okay? He was talking about premillennial and postmillennial and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, in my mind, literally like, what? I didn't say that out loud because then I would look dumb, right? And you know the other reason why I didn't say it out loud? Because I didn't care. I didn't care what he was talking about at all. I literally could have cared less. And we were both Christian people talking to each other. I could have cared less because I didn't know what that meant. And there was nothing coming from him that showed me something different than just somebody talking about information. Am I saying those things are not important? Eh. <laughs> Here's what I'm saying. When I, as I read the Bible, as I look at things, when I stand before Jesus, according to what I read in Scripture, and I, you know, listen, I could be wrong, but this is the way I see it. I don't feel like Jesus is going to stand up there and, and be like, okay, Dale, since you learned exactly how to study the Bible and you know the study of the Holy Spirit and you know about whether or not I was going to come back before or after the, rap- before or after the rapture, you can enter in. Because I'm pretty sure the Bible says, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into my rest. I think the Bible says, you know what? I know you. I know you. So you can come in. Being known by Jesus, that's what's important. Right? So we're talking about preserving knowledge and being a messenger and instructing. It's about knowing him, not knowing a bunch of facts about him again, right? It seems to me that introducing people to Jesus and showing him and teaching them how to walk in relationship with him is more valuable than a bunch of facts about Jesus. That's not preserving knowledge. Preserving knowledge would be more like, oh, let me preserve the things that are really important, like his love. So Decide what kind of knowledge you're going to preserve. All right. We each have a decision today. You get to decide. And it goes back to your actual actions, right? We don't just get to say things and be like, oh, that's my decision. That's not the way it works. Bottom line uh, of the decision. And, and, and if you're like bogged down by the five points and those words that I said, and it was like, what is he talking about? Listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to boil it down to you like this. This is real easy. Just stay right here. If you do not listen... That's what it says in chapter 2, verse 2. If you do not listen. Here's the decision. You can either listen to God or not listen to God. Those are your choices. That's it. If you listen to God, then you should do what he says. Because the Bible tells us, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what he says. Right? So if you listen, do what he says. So if you listen to God, do what he says. If you're not going to listen to God, that's your choice too. But you made the decision at that point. You get to decide, listen to God or not. And this is what we're going to decide every day. Every day you're going to decide this. But I guarantee you, if you do not listen, you will not be doing what he says. You're not just going to fall into doing what you know, he says without listening to him. That's just not the way it works. And honestly, at that point, right here, you know what I'm saying? You guys know what that is? I'll say it one more time. You might as well just rub some poop on your face. Where we're at. I don't, I don't want us to do that, okay? I don't, definitely don't want God to do that to us. Let's pray. God, you're good to us. Thank you for today. Lord, I pray right now that we would be those that are quick to listen to you. Quick to listen. Eager to listen. Desiring to listen. And that the things that you tell us, Lord, we would put into practice and we would walk them out in our lives because we love you. Because we love you. Because you're the prize. Because you are everything. Because there's nothing better than you. I pray that we would walk in the things that you give to us because we are completely infatuated and adore you. And it's like we can't get enough of you. And because of that, Lord, we just want to draw close to you. We want to hear your voice. When we hear your voice, we're excited to do whatever it is you call us to do. 
And then we want to hear it again and again and again, and we don't ever want to stop hearing it. God, let us be those people. Let us decide that today, that we would follow you wholeheartedly with every part of our being, with heart, soul, mind, strength. Lord, we would love you and run after you. God, I thank you for this day. I pray that you would bless each person here, Lord, and I pray that... um, that you would just continue to do a work in each of our lives, that we are, none of us in this room are a finished product. None of us are, are, have arrived. We are all broken, sinful people trying to draw close to you. Help us to do that, God. We want to do that because we love you and we desire you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, have an amazing day. Be blessed again. Happy Mother's Day. Sorry about all the poop. <laughs>